Seneca Falls, a picturesque town in upstate New York. The kind of place where your luck can turn for the better. At least Carl Carlson hopes so. And he has made a pretty good life for himself here with his second wife, Cindy, and three kids. When I first met him, he seemed like a very doting father. He seemed very engaged in the, his children's lives. The same kids he saved from a raging house fire that tragically took the life of his first wife, Christina, back in Northern California. He had shown me an article in the newspaper out in California they had written in calling him a hero for saving the children. Did you see scars from burns on him? No, I saw no scars. Cindy tells our Andrea Isom he was a man with a haunted, hurting past. I felt sorry for him. Now he's a single dad to three kids trying to raise, raise them on his own. Cindy and Carl marry and have a son together named Alex. The tragic past appears to be behind him. Their days are full of love and laughter and family fun. A little heart. Heart! It's a wonderful life, and Carl is a lucky man indeed. But Carl's bad luck will not be denied so easily. And one night, he wakes up Cindy in a frenzied panic. I was starting to drift back off to sleep, and he sat up and looked out the window and told me to call 911 that the barn was on fire. Trapped in the barn, her husband's three prized Belgian horses. And um, they weren't going to get out. Pretty much the barn was engulfed. Tragically, none of them survived the inferno. Was he screaming, yelling, crying? What was his um, reaction? When he was trying to open the doors um, so that he could get to the horses, but it was a metal door, so of course that was very hot. And now cracks in the once strong family bond begin to show up. Carlson once saved his son Levi from the house fire that killed his mother, but now the relationship between the two has become strained. According to the things that Levi had shared with us, it was bad. His father was always mean to him, and he just wanted to be accepted by his dad. During Levi's teenage years, he rebelled. Um, there was a lot of arguing, fighting all the time. Just, it, it wasn't good. Levi spends a lot less time at home and more time at Cindy Meckley's house with her kids. But she says Levi is a tortured young man. There wasn't a night that he didn't wake up in a cold sweat and crying. Haunted by the death of his mother in that long ago heartbreaking fire. He could hear his mom screaming. And his father got his two sisters out, but didn't get his mother out. And he never could figure that out because he said he could hear her screaming. And that's what he hears at night. But Levi soon ends up a divorced dad with two young daughters of his own to look after. And his stepmom says he also tries to mend fences at home. Levi was always seeking Carl's approval. Seemed like he wanted to turn his life around and start living the right path. Carl starts paying Levi to do odd jobs around the house. One day, he gives him $50 to do some work on his truck. Carl said he was going to go out and tell Levi that we were leaving. No, you know, nothing seemed odd. Carl came and got in the car, and we went. Four hours later, they return home, and Cindy says Carlson heads into the garage to check on Levi. And then he comes running out with horrific news. He was banging on the side of the house, banging on the windows, telling me to call 911. The truck had fallen on Levi. 911, what's the location of your emergency? I think I need an ambulance. Okay, what's going on? The truck fell on my stepson. Are you with your son right now? <laughs> He's not alive. Is he, is he breathing? No. Okay, we're going to start CPR, okay? Yeah, Carl, they want to start CPR. Do you know CPR? Just test this crust. I know this may be hard for you to say, but what did you see? I saw an indentation in his chest where the truck had landed and I touched his leg to see if there was any warmth and there wasn't. Tragedy strikes Carl yet again. Levi is dead at the scene. Carl was very distraught, throwing himself up against the barn walls, crying, laying on the ground. Law enforcement was trying to console Carl because he was so distraught. 
Cindy Carlson steps on Levi is dead, crushed under the truck he was working on in his father's garage. Sadly, it's the type of tragedy that's not unheard of in this part of the country. In an agricultural area, farm accidents are not uncommon here, and uh, it didn't appear to be anything but an accident. But the loss of his son is just more of the escalating bad luck that has been dogging Carl Carlson for most of his adult life, beginning decades before when his new car burns up in his driveway. And it has people wondering, what is it with Carl Carlson and bad luck? How can one man be so cursed? A little unusual for a brand new car to burn up, and a witness had, had said that they, that they had seen him cleaning the car out before that fire. And then there's the tragic house fire back in California that took the life of Carl's first wife, Christina, also ruled an accident, but leaving some lingering questions. I saw the report from California. It was just a basic preliminary report done at the time of that fire, but it didn't add up. He told three different stories on how it happened to the medical examiner, the police, and the firemen. The flames were too high for him to get to her. He told me he suffered burns from trying to save her. He also told me that they were heating with kerosene heaters and that the dogs had um, knocked it over days before and they had soaked it up with some clothes that were there and um, that maybe a spark from the dryer or whatever that was out right outside the bathroom door had caused it to ignite. Carl's second wife, Cindy, tells our Andrea Isom she thinks back to the night of the barn fire that killed Carl's treasured horses. Something just doesn't fit. I had asked him how he knew the barn was on fire because to view the barn out our window, you had to look back. And he had told me that he heard the crackling. Um, I didn't hear any crackling. And she simply can't let go of Levi's death under that truck. Even the fact that he was working on it in the first place seems strange. We never really used it. So for Levi to be working on it, I, I, I thought it was odd. You know, but a lot, a lot of things that Carl did were odd. No matter how hard she tries, Cindy can't get it out of her head. The idea that her husband doesn't only attract bad luck, somehow he creates it. I would just berate myself and I started thinking maybe I was going crazy. And then I would go on for a few months again until the next panic attack would happen. She confides in a close friend. I told her everything, my suspicions, and I wanted her to tell me I was crazy. You know, I asked her to please just tell me that I'm crazy because I'd rather hear that than what I'm actually thinking. Then a turning point. Cindy gets a call from police who have been alerted to her suspicions by another family member. He asked if I would come in and talk with him about Levi's death, and I was so relieved, so relieved. She definitely was suspicious that he, he may have murdered Levi and that she might be next. Cindy is scared of her husband, Carl, convinced the terrible tragedies in his life are not accidents. Now she's talking to the cops, telling them she believes he even had a hand in killing his own son. It just seemed like too many things happened to Carl, and he was involved in some way. Fearing for her own safety, Cindy tells our Andrea Isom she took her young son, Alex, and left the home she shared with Carl. I had just been so tired of being terrified all the time that I decided to take Alex and just go and hide out. But Carl wants to patch things up, and Cindy comes up with a plan to get to the truth. I told him that I could only get back together with him if I felt he had been telling me the whole truth. But if he wasn't going to confess to me, then um, we had no chance of getting back together. She agrees to meet Carl at a restaurant for lunch. She's wearing a homemade wire to get everything on tape. It was a little voice recorder, so I just stuck it in my bra. And what she says she hears stuns her beyond belief. He told me that he pushed the truck. I asked him if it was hard to push. He said no. He gave me a demonstration of what it was like. He said then he saw the opportunity and took advantage of it. An astonished Cindy rushes the recording to police, but they don't hear the same thing. In fact, they hear nothing but noise. The recording didn't come out. You couldn't, you couldn't make out anything. 
And now cops find themselves at a crucial turning point in this growing investigation. And they need Cindy to go way out on a limb once again. It was dangerous. She agreed to meet him under controlled circumstances, wearing a wire and seeing if we could recreate that conversation and get it documented where he talks about Levi's dad. Cindy meets Carl one last time at Abigail's restaurant. This time she says he's leery, but she keeps it together. He was suspicious that he was being taped and I did offer for him to look through my purse. He declined and I think that was enough to maybe make him feel a little more trusting. I asked you if you pushed the truck and you said yes. I didn't push the truck, I said no, but I said I took advantage of the situation once it happened. Carl, you told me that you didn't set it up that way, but when you were in there, you saw the opportunity. No, after it had happened, then I panicked and saw the opportunity. He saw the opportunity? It's a shocking admission, one that takes even police by surprise. When he said he saw uh, the, the truck on top of the jack with Levi, he saw that as an opportunity. So this is a parent uh, talking about their child, uh, referring to their death as an opportunity. There's no way you can spin that to be anything other than cold-hearted, no empathy. He obviously didn't feel bad about that, that death at all. Now, police do a full-scale investigation into Carlson's alleged episodes of bad luck, and the results are jaw-dropping. Levi had actually, through work, signed up to do a life insurance policy, and he made Carl beneficiary because he didn't trust his ex-wife to um, handle any money for the girls, you know, and that made sense to me. That's right, the seemingly accidental death of the child he once saved from a fire put $700,000 in Carlson's pocket. The medical examiner signed off on it, there was no autopsy, and, and the case really is closed at that point as an accidental death. But it's about to be reopened, and cops also take another look at the fire that killed Carlson's first wife in California. That tragic death was ruled an accident too. Suddenly a terrifying pattern emerges. Cops find out Carlson also took out a $200,000 insurance policy on her life. This is a man who's working at maybe minimum wage at best. He's not making a lot of money, and it's taken out within a couple of weeks of the death. And now she's trapped in a burning house with no way out. The victim dies in a bathroom with a window boarded up and a kerosene spill in the area in front of the door. A window Carlson told investigators he boarded up months before the fire. Not so, say police. We know from witnesses that it happened probably that morning, if not the day before. And it seems to police that Carlson's bad luck is always followed up with a check from an insurance company. He received $700,000 when his son died, $200,000 when his first wife was killed in the fire. 115000 collected on the barn fire that killed his horses, and $10,000 from that new car that blew up, for a grand total of more than a million bucks. Cops now know one thing. They want to talk to Carl Carlson ASAP. What go? The truck. As it turns out, Carl loves to talk. How'd the truck kill him? It landed on him. But that story changes as cops slowly grind him down after hours of interrogation. I could not kill him, that, that, or take his life, do whatever. I couldn't. I love that kid with every, every part. There's of no way that that's true. There's <laughs> no way that if you love him that much that you walk out of there and let him lie like four and a half hours. I know I walked away from him. Yeah, after you pushed the truck. Yeah, you did. I opened the truck door because I had to get inside to move the linkage for the f truck. And when I did, it tipped, and it just fell over. So the truck fell on, on your son, and instead of jacking it back up, you ran. It didn't register. It just blanked. So I just got the hell out of there, like a kid that threw a window through a glass or something and didn't want to get caught. But cops believe Carl did want to get paid. Remember, he's the sole beneficiary of his son's $700,000 life insurance policy. And nothing to do with insurance policy? Nothing. I never even thought of it at that time. I just thought, oh, f Do you think that I believe that? Not only do you run, you don't run and go into panic. You get in your car calmly and say to your wife, 
Hey, hon, are you ready to go to the funeral? I say, so the, the brutal truth, were, were my words to him, is that you caused the truck to fall on him and you left him dying on the floor. And he says, yeah, that's what happened. The bombshell confession leads to murder charges. We're at the stage where this is depraved indifference murder in New York, which is the same as intentional murder. And now on the eve of his murder trial for killing his son, another shocker. Carlson is the one who calls the cops. Well, I run up there not even having any idea what this is going to be about. And he's decided he's going to plead guilty to the murder uh, in, in the second degree. And to make that plea official, he has to answer a few questions. Did you know that when you enticed him underneath this truck, you were putting his life at risk? Yes. Did you cause the truck to fall on him? Yes. Did you leave while he was still alive, knowing it would result in his death? Yes. And he's talking like it's the weather. Guilty for murder in the second degree. Carlson is sentenced to 15 years to life behind bars. He's dead to me. I don't think there's anything that I could say to him that would make him feel guilty or remorseful. He does not have those feelings. But Carl's real bad luck is just beginning. Now the state of California makes its move, charging him in the murder of Christina in that fatal fire. I don't think he has any empathy in him at all. He's a scary individual. Carlson has pleaded not guilty to that charge, but believe it or not, there are more shocking revelations. Second wife Cindy says Carlson may have been stopped in the nick of time. It turns out he had also taken out life insurance policies on Levi's kids, $350,000 a piece on his own grandchildren without the knowledge of their mother. We know that he had a rather large life insurance policy on both of those. It was over $350,000 on each child. To Cindy, it's like something straight out of a horror movie. At the time that him and I had separated, was adamant that he was going to get my granddaughters for visits. Um, this terrified me because I knew that he was thinking of a way to set up an accident for them to collect on um, the insurance money. A couple days before Christmas, Levi's widow brought the two grandchildren here to our office and she said, I wanted uh, my daughters to meet the officers that saved their lives. So, well, always remember that. And Cindy has great cause for relief for herself. That's because, you guessed it, Carlson was also poised to reap a big reward if anything happened to her. He stood to make, uh, make a lot of money if, uh, if, if she died. It was over a million dollars. Prosecutors say he covered his victims with insurance. And now Cindy hopes those charges will ensure that Carlson stays locked up for good. I don't think there is a word or a title that exists. You know, evil, diabolical. They're just not strong enough words to describe. He's not human.